This is a huge part of engineering textbooks that I'm currently very slowly but surely working my way through. I love textbooks and it's a self-study resource that I see rarely mentioned by the sort of autodidact community. I think the reason for that is if you just start trying to work your way through a textbook, you find that it's a lot harder than you think it might be from the outset. And as an independent learner, using what are primarily tools created for courses and educators, you're gonna run into some challenges. My name's Harry Smith and this is Pages to Practice. And this channel is all about taking what's inside of here and putting it into here. And today, we're gonna to look at some common pitfalls when using textbooks for self-education and how you can use textbooks as a really effective tool for learning about all sorts of different topics. But to understand that, first we're gonna to need to understand some of the peculiarities of the textbook publishing industry, which I know that's not about study, but it really help you understand how these books are constructed and what the challenges of reading them are. Now the textbook industry is a funny business. You might think that what gets published is the best textbook for the job, the best learning tool, but that's just not true. And I know it sounds like a truism for a business to care about making money, but the textbook publishing industry really cares about making a lot of money out of students. And if you went to university and you had to buy some textbooks, you probably remember that those textbooks were expensive, they were overly long and very wordy. And unfortunately, this is by design. The textbook industry makes its money by embedding universities and colleges into courses and ecosystems that it becomes very hard for their instructors to escape. Now, the reason they're able to do that is because the textbook makers do what is often the hardest part of a course, designing the problem sets, structuring the information and giving the answers and solutions. But there's been this sort of race to produce the textbook that's the most comprehensive, has the most problems, has the most explanation, which means that the page counts of textbooks have blown up over the years and every year sees a new edition with extra content, more and more and more, so that they can sell you and sell students new editions. But what does that mean for us as the self-studier working from these textbooks? We can use this understanding, firstly, to note that the edition of a textbook often doesn't mean anything. and the second edition or the fifth edition, it's all really the same. The problem sets aren't always designed for effect sometimes just for volume. Not every textbook is as good as any other textbook. And in fact, some of them are pretty bad. Because of this word count element to their publishing, many textbooks have huge amounts of exposition and explanation about a concept. If you understand the concept, you can just skip it. Now we've got some of the context about what the challenges from textbooks are and how they arise. Let's dive into how to use these textbooks and why I love them as a self-study resource. With a bit of research, you'll find that almost any topic will have a textbook that is considered the seminal educational work for that topic. And it will be held by students in an almost mythological manner. And for good reason, because working through a textbook is often one of the most difficult things you can do in your study. And you go from understanding nothing about a topic to a really deep and detailed understanding. There are textbooks on some of our best and most brilliant and most complex ideas that have ever occurred in the school of human thought. And by going from page one to page 1000, you too can understand that idea. That's a beautiful and romantic vision of what education is. And some of these textbooks have been produced by the very best educators for that topic that have ever existed. If you try and approach a textbook like a course or like a lesson, or you're likely to run into some trouble. They are, you can just tell by looking at them, monstrously long, extremely detailed, and often excessively so. It's not clear what the prerequisite of any particular textbook is. And sometimes you might work through a couple of chapters and find you hit a wall. And some textbooks have amazing chapters on one topic and terrible chapters on another. In other cases, textbooks are designed to achieve years of tuition and to be studied over the course of multiple semesters of full-time education. You should expect as a busy adult with other things to do, that your engagement with a textbook won't be quite the same as like engaging with a book. You could expect maybe to use one of these textbooks for months, if not years. And textbooks broadly fall into two camps, those that are theory-based and those that are application-based. And you need to know what exactly it is that you're trying to achieve so that you can choose one that meets your needs. So the first step to avoid a lot of hide is to explore a textbook thoroughly before committing to buying one. Now, buying them new is extremely expensive and you don't want to get it wrong. I'm going to talk about later really cheap and easy ways to get textbooks that can lower that commitment hurdle. But even then, before that, you should read the table of contents, you should try and find reviews, 
And if you can get a preview or a snapshot of the first section of the textbook, which is usually available, it'll be really useful for students and also for educators page. It'll explain how the textbook works, how it should be studied, how the problem sets are constructed. And that'll give you an idea of what the prerequisites are, whether it meets your needs, and whether this is gonna be something that you're gonna to wanna to put a lot of time into. Now, once you look around at textbooks for a little while, you're gonna find that textbooks fall into sort of three main styles. And I call those styles the self-learner style, the traditional style, and the unforgiving style. And I've actually got an example of each one of those textbooks here to show you. Now, in my opinion, the gold standard of self-study textbooks is this, Engineering Mathematics by Stroud. And what a self-study textbook is, is one that's designed for people like you and me to work through on their own. And this was written for engineering students who are doing engineering degrees to teach them the maths that they need. But it was designed as a supplement to their studies, which means that it's not designed to be supported by a class or a lecturer or an educator, but for you to work forwards through a linear process. And this book does an amazing job of it. You move between frames, sections of the page, answering questions as you go. It goes back and reviews that content regularly. It makes important notes of things that are hard or difficult to remember. And make sure that you're forced to remember them often. And just by working through this, you can really learn a huge amount of method for maths without necessarily getting bogged down in proofs which engineering students aren't interested in. Self-study textbooks aren't as common as the traditional style or what I call the unforgiving style, maybe because of the difficulty of writing them. But if you can find one for a topic, like this one, if you're in any way interested in maths, they're a hugely effective tool for the self-learner. Now the second style of textbook is what I call the traditional style. I've got an example of one here. So this is a textbook I picked up recently. It's Thermodynamics and Engineering Approach. And what's different about these and the self-study style is that this is going to be much more familiar from school. Instead of being this sort of step-by-step -step approach, they're presenting topics, you're learning about those topics, it's colourful, it's got lots of diagrams, and then there will be a problem set and review questions at the end of the section. Now, if you've ever done any education with a textbook, you'll be very familiar with how these textbooks are written. Now, to use these textbooks effectively, you need to bear in mind that they're meant to be for courses and educators. Educators will usually assign some reading, and then they'll assign a selection of the problem set. Trying to work from front to cover in these books is often very difficult. And though you can read them relatively easily, trying to do all the problems in them will just take forever. And sometimes a textbook really is worth doing every problem. And if you're struggling with something, then maybe you should. I'm going to talk more about doing problem sets a little bit later in this video. In terms of self-study assistance, this is a step down from something like engineering mathematics, but it's a step up from what I'm going to talk about next, which is the unforgiving style of textbook. This is Mechanics of Fluids by Massey, a classic fluid mechanic text in engineering. And why I say that this is unforgiving, and I haven't read it, but it matches a style of more advanced textbooks, is that there's very few diagrams in this. It's long passages of text. It doesn't hold your hand. You know, when it goes through the mathematics, it skips forwards through the steps. It uses that infuriating phrase, it is obvious to show that. Now, just because it's unforgiving doesn't mean that these textbooks aren't good. In fact, they're very good, but you will need a lot of experience self-studying and a lot of discipline and a lot of time to work your way through these. You can expect one or two pages to take you hours of study. Now, the good thing is, is that if you're just starting out with a topic, most of these textbooks are about graduate level topics, which means that you're a long way from having to approach one. But just know that they exist, know that they're difficult, and know that if you are trying to study something advanced on your own, these textbooks often need supporting material because they're designed to be used in a graduate educational setting. Once you've selected a textbook to self-study, you're going to want to make a very upfront decision about the level of detail that you're going to study that book in. At the lowest level of detail, you can just read through a textbook. And now that seems kind of like a strange thing to do, but it really doesn't take that long. And you'll get a really good sense of a whole overview of an area of education. And while you won't be able to say that you've learned it, you'll certainly know more than you did when you start. And also, maybe then you'll go back and do the problems or study it in more detail. And I've often used this for textbooks in areas that I'm not primarily pursuing right now, but have an interest in. You know, I'm reading a lot of classics, so I might pick up a textbook that's used in literature courses to talk about critical analysis. And while I don't have to do the writing exercises and the problems in that work, I can just move through it and pick up some knowledge. The sort of next level would be to engage in sort of a medium level way, to do some of the problems, to take notes, but not worry about understanding every single aspect. You'll find that problem sets often contain work that connects to other areas or 
requires really detailed thinking and, and those insights can be very powerful indeed. But I'm going to reserve those for the next level of study. I think really for the self-study, the majority of your textbook study should fall in this realm. You should expect that as an independent, it's going to be harder for you to study this stuff than somebody at a university. And so rather than getting hung up on understanding 100% of the text, you can settle for a much lower percentage and use it as a more integrated, holistic plan to learn a topic. And the final way you can study a textbook, as I alluded to, is obviously is that you can do it front to cover 100% of the problem set in 100% detail. And this should be reserved only for things that really matter and also textbooks that you really know are going to do the job. And these are the seminal textbooks that I was talking about. You know, things like Strang's Introduction to Linear Algebra or Stewart's Calculus. These textbooks are famous in certain circles for a reason. This engineering mathematics textbook, I'm studying front to cover because it's designed to be used that way, but it's also excellent at what it does. So all of that to say is understand what your goal with the textbook is and how much you're going to study it. And that'll stop you getting bogged down in works you just don't need that level of effort for. So let's return to that question of how many of the problems should you do and should you do the whole problem set? You're going to find people out there who say, yes, you should do every problem in the textbook. I don't think this is an efficient way to go about things. So I'm going to offer an alternate approach that still focuses on doing a lot of problems and drilling skills, but it focuses on moving on from things that you've mastered. So you'll find in most textbook problem sets, you'll get the solution to half the problem either the even or the odd problems. Let's say it's the odd. What I like to do is I like to do every other odd problem. Do that because a problem set for a chapter might be 100 problems long. And they'll generally start easy and get harder as time goes on. And what I'll do is, so I'll start at one, and then if I get that right, I'll go every other odd, so I'll go to five. And if I get that right, I'll go to nine, and so on and so forth. Now if I get one wrong, for example, I get nine wrong, I'll go back to six. I'll go back to the last place I got a question right. If I get that right, then maybe I'll go to nine again or, or 10. So the things that I'm missing serve as places to go back to when my understanding is incomplete. This means that the easy stuff you move through quickly and the hard stuff you spend more time on, which is exactly what you want to be doing. I'd also say that you should at least read the questions in between. For one, sometimes the topic of a problem set changes quite rapidly and you might miss the introductory questions, in which case you should maybe start again from that number, or it might just have something interesting that you want to explore. And, well, you should follow your curiosity. In general, I approach studying these textbooks like I approach most things. I'll break the table of contents of a textbook up into one to two hour chunks. So often that'll mean that one chunk will be just reading the chapter text, and then maybe it'll take one, two, or three chunks to work through the selection of the problem set that I'm planning on doing. And then, I generally just do one chunk a day. If I really attack a textbook, I find that I get burnt out on the content. And also, it's not the most effective way to learn something. The gap, and thus the recall that you need, is a better way of going about things. I'm always paying attention to if I'm hitting a wall. If I find myself getting lots of questions wrong and really struggling to make progress, then I'll either go back to the chapter text, or I'll go onto the internet or other textbooks or YouTube to find other resources. There's no point banging your head against the wall. And of course, I'm a big fan of the efficient problem set idea that I've just outlined. And I recommend that you do that, especially if the problem sets are very long. Now, if the problem set is short, 10 to 15 problems, maybe just do them all. But I think there's a lot of efficiency to be gained by not doing 100 problems. Now, of course, I've sort of glossed over so far how you find good textbooks. And it's a little bit difficult, like any research topic, to really explain the best places to go. The information is spread out. Now, Reddit can be a really useful resource for textbook recommendations, and a lot of universities release the textbook lists that they use for their courses. And if you respect that university and you respect that course, then maybe that textbook is for you. However, remember that a lot of universities are bought into textbook programs that they don't necessarily strictly control, which means that they might be using a textbook that isn't the best in that topic. So it's worth researching broadly and then select. And I'll link down below to the Susan Rigetti self-study links for philosophy, maths and physics. I've talked about these before and they're an excellent resource and each list includes textbooks that cover all the way from the beginning of undergraduate all the way up to graduate level study for those topics. Now fortunately there is little need to buy textbooks new but even more fortunately and really excitingly there are textbooks that don't cost anything at all 
And you shouldn't be deterred by the fact that these textbooks are free. There is a huge movement in the university educating world for open education resources. Educators have recognised the problem with the textbook publishing industry and have decided to do something about it by releasing these educational resources for free. There's a whole bunch of places that you can go to find free textbooks and I'm going to link them all in the description below. But just to go over some of them, there's a website called Real Not Complex, which has free textbooks with a really high standard. It's a curated list for every branch of mathematics you can think about, from the very early stages to very advanced topics. It's a really, really fascinating website. You should check it out. The next website is a place called OpenStax. OpenStax is a project to produce free textbooks for use on courses, and their textbooks are used at all sorts of universities and colleges around the world, and they cover a huge amount of subjects. That's a really interesting place to go and look. If you're not familiar with MIT OpenCourseWare, then you're really missing out on one of the most amazing educational resources there is. MIT, probably the best engineering college in the world, they open source a huge amount of their course material. In a lot of cases, the textbook is available, and in almost all cases, the lecture notes and the problem sets and the answers are all available. You can find a huge amount of really interesting stuff. There's even a guy who wrote a book called Ultra Learning who worked through the whole MIT syllabus in a very short amount of time. It's an interesting book. Uh, it's not the best book in the world, but it's certainly an interesting idea. And finally, there's uh, a place called the OER Commons or the Open Educational Resource Commons, which is kind of a database of open educational resources. It includes a lot of stuff on those previous lists, but also a lot of things from other smaller repositories. We really live in a golden age of free and open access education uh, with both textbooks and things like YouTube and Khan Academy. And so there is no excuse for you getting a college level education through your own effort. The only thing you won't have is the piece of paper. Now you might be surprised to find that pretty much every textbook in this stack cost me three to four pounds on the second hand. And there's a huge market for second hand textbooks because people buy them for their university courses and then they never really need them ever again. You shouldn't be afraid of buying the older version of a textbook. As I said, most editions just include additional problem sets. And on the rare occasion, there are better editions and you'll easily find out what they are from your research. But you'll find that also the better edition is most widely available anyway, and usually the cheapest one to get hold of. Now you should know that obviously education is constantly evolving. And if you buy particularly old textbooks, you may find some techniques or way of teaching that are unfamiliar to how it's taught in the modern time. For example, calculus has been taught in a number of different ways over its history. And some of the older ways that you find if you read a really old calculus textbook don't match the more modern method. And the modern method are vastly improved in this subject. So it's just something to bear in mind when you're doing your research. There are a lot of places that you can find secondhand textbooks. Uh, I bought a lot of these on a website called Abooks, which is a worldwide secondhand book distributor. You can also find them on eBay and other places like that. In particular, one amazing source of secondhand textbooks is open university textbooks. Now I'm an open university student for engineering and they send me uh, engineering textbooks for each module, which are in my cupboard. And people sell these. Uh, now they do cost a little bit more than maybe these do, but they are designed for distance learning. The Open Uni is an expert in teaching people about them being present at the university. That's the whole idea. So if you're looking for a very guided approach, then those textbooks might be exactly what you're looking for. Now I want to thank you very much for listening and I hope that I've inspired you to think about what textbooks you could use to learn whatever topic that you're studying. And I focus a lot on engineering, maths and science because those are the things that I study. But there are textbooks on just about every topic you can imagine. If they do a degree in it, you can learn it. If you've got a favourite textbook or there's a textbook you're studying at the moment, let me know in the comments below. For now, I want to thank you very much for listening. My name is Harry Smith and this is Pages to Practice.